tie stuck in my book, and I've got almost torn apart here coming up from the stage. <laughs> Look like a goofball up here, tie flying everywhere, collar wide open. <clears throat> Back to reality here. How many of you, I'm going to start something off here a little bit weird. How many of you in years gone by remember Mad Magazine? Boy, just about everybody. Wow. <laughs> I knew this was a weird group. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to read that quite a bit. Uh, it was just a fascinating magazine. It was like one of the first things that came out for total satire about virtually everything on the planet. If you were a fan of Mad Magazine at all, you would then remember this key individual. His name was Alfred E. Newman the goofy-looking kid that became the iconic look of Mad Magazine. He was defined by Mad Magazine as the idiot kid. There is a debate about who actually came up with him and how he ultimately ended up on the cover of Mad Magazine. It actually makes quite an interesting story to listen to this debate going on about who created the idiot kid. But his iconic saying is what really caught on once he started playing with it. The iconic saying is, what? Me worry? This line was a humorous satire intending to make light of the need to worry about anything. He was actually more on target than we want to give him credit for. Turn with me, if you would, over to Matthew chapter 6 as we begin today. Matthew chapter 6. There is an old proverb, and I'm not even sure where it came from. I couldn't find it. But this proverb says this. Worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. The late Earl Nightingale, a well-known commentator and motivational speaker, wrote many years ago this. Worry is like a dense fog that can cloud our vision, knock out our perspective, knock our perspective out of kilter and actually slow us down. I think we can all agree that when it comes to participating and being a member of the human race, worry is a, just a part of the baggage that we carry around with us as human beings. It's more of a problem for some than others, but I think if we'd all acknowledge it, at some point in time, we have worried about something somewhere along the way. When we did the Challenges of Life survey a couple of weeks ago, and I gave you all those different emotions about life, worry was in the top three in both Reno and Sacramento congregations, right at the top. Listen to what Jesus Christ himself has to say about worry, the concept of worry here in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin in Matthew 6 and verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? This statement actually ties into a recent sermon that we had talking about this physical life, and we focus too much on this physical life it's not the best for us because it gets us off kilter and gets us off track because we're not really focusing on what God wants us to focus on. Christ is essentially asking a question here. He's essentially asking, if God made you, don't you think he can sustain you? When we think about it, if we as individuals buy into the concept, and I'm assuming everybody in this room buys into the concept that God is the creator God, if we buy into the concept of a creator God, don't you think it's absolutely necessary to buy into the concept of a sustainer God? The two go hand in glove. To not do so would actually be inconsistent in our thinking. If we believe that God is a creator, to not believe that God is the sustainer of life. You really can't have one without the other. He then gives a couple of example, examples for us to try and relate to in this whole concept of worry that he's talking about. He also, I believe, is going to show us something else about worry. 
not just that it's being inconsistent in our thinking, which truly it is in this first statement that he makes, worry is inconsistent in our thinking, but he's going to also show us in the next couple of verses here that being an individual gets involved in worry is actually irrational. Verse 26 of Matthew 6. He said, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? We see these things all the time, don't we? These birds in the air, all these things that were created by God. We look at them, we look at them, these living creatures, but then we've got to realize God created us to care for them. God created us to be overseers of them. If God is that concerned about these birds in the air and all that kind of stuff, wouldn't he be more concerned about us, the ones he created to tend over them and watch over them? Hold your place here in Matthew 6 with a ribbon or a card or something like that. And just flip over a couple pages to your right to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Here in Matthew 10, we will see Christ's analogy of our value over the value of an insignificant bird, the sparrow. I don't care where you live in this country. I've lived on the East Coast. I've lived in the Midwest. I've lived in the Southwest. I've lived in the North. I've lived everywhere. There's sparrows everywhere. They're like the most insignificant bird you can possibly imagine. Those gray, brownish, blackish, bland-looking, nothing-looking birds. They don't seem to contribute anything except they'll eat anything. They're everywhere. Everywhere. If you have bird feeders, you are going to have sparrows. I don't care if you've got food in there that a sparrow can't eat. They're going to be at the bird feeders. It seems a bit silly to be making a value comparison with something like a sparrow to a human being. But this is a powerful point is made here in Matthew 10. There is a similar reference that Jesus Christ makes about the sparrow and the relationship to man found in Luke 12. I am not going to turn there today. You can look at it later if you'd like to. Let's pick it up in Matthew 10 and begin in verse 29. Matthew 10, 29. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. He's talking about the value here. The value, first of all, is that he's talking about something that's like one-sixteenth of a denarius, which is not a lot of money. So he's saying, you know, you can buy two sparrows for a pittance. They're worthless, basically, is what he's saying. He said, but... Uh, not a sparrow dies that God's not aware of. Not a sparrow dies outside the will of God. I wonder if we've ever thought about it in these terms. This is what Jesus Christ is trying to tell us. When something as insignificant as a sparrow, that there's probably billions and billions of, of them in this country. According to Jesus Christ, not one sparrow falls to the ground that God's not in charge of. God's aware of this happening. But he goes on, verse 10, verse 30. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. How insignificant is a hair? I mean, I can reach up here and probably pull one out. If I can grab a hold. Missed it. Every time you brush your hair, some hair falls out. Every time you wash your hair, some hair falls out. Your eyebrows fall out. The hair is coming. Hair is insignificant. Yet Jesus Christ said, you know what? God is so meticulous about the body that he created. And he took such personal interest in it. He's actually got every hair on your head numbered. And when hair number 3,493,223 falls out, he's aware of that. How do I know that? I just made it up. <laughs> but it's interesting to note this relationship. Jesus Christ is trying to find something as insignificant as he can find. He's like a hair. But listen to what he says. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, for you are more of more value than many sparrows. Jesus Christ is trying to say, you know what? God is so intently focused on what he has created whether it's an insignificant sparrow or whether it's a hair on your head. He said, but you are his special treasure. And if he cares about the number of hairs on your head, and if he cares about when a sparrow dies, don't you think he's really going to care about you? 
the care level is monumentally higher. It's off the charts. And this is what Jesus Christ is trying to get us to see and understand. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Christ points out, as we just read Matthew 10, that if God keeps inventory of such incidental things as sparrows and hairs on your head, how much more does he keep track of our needs, our wants, our desires, our necessities? He again pointed out how pointed out how important we are to God and to Jesus Christ. We are ultimately important. So he points out that worry is not just inconsistent when we think about it, but it's also very irrational, totally irrational. He then goes on with a few more thoughts to consider about this whole concept of worrying. We'll next also find out that worry is also ineffective. It doesn't work to do anything in our lives. Verse 27. He says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you read through commentaries on this verse, you can read arguments as to what this actually means. I thought I knew what it meant all the time. Whichever way you go, it really has the same impact of teaching. It's easy to conclude that this may mean by worrying you could add inches of height to yourself. How cool would that be? If I was a growing boy, teenager, and I wanted to play basketball, and I was pretty good, and I'm only five foot ten like I am now, and I was already good, what would it be like if I could be 6'6"? By worrying. I could worry really hard and get up to six foot, worry harder and get up to six two, worry really hard and get up to six four, and really, really worry hard and get up to six six. Now... I'm a basketball player or a bodybuilder or a weightlifter. I mean, you go anywhere you want with it. It would be so cool if you could do that. Jesus Christ said, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> you worry all you want. It's not going to happen. It's totally ineffective. It's not going to make anything work. But as some commentaries also discuss, maybe it's referring to adding days to our lives, actually adding extension to our lives. So if we were worrying hard enough, we could add maybe a second, a minute, Christ said, you know, you can't, you can't add anything to your life. You can't add an hour. You can't add a minute. You can't add a So You can't add anything. That's because all of this stuff that we're talking about here, this is all in God's control. It's not in our control. Always God's control. Have you ever seen a pet mouse? or had, How many of you have ever had a pet mouse in your life? Let me see the hands. A few people. A few of you. Pet hamster, pet whatever, you know. Any of those kind of little animals, little creatures that you put in a cage and you buy them these little rings, they're little circular things. It almost looks like a little mini Ferris wheel. And they get inside that ring and they climb on it and they, they, they can run on this wheel. It's like a little spinning wheel. I'm sure you've all seen this. Well, the mouse every once in a while decides, I guess, it's time to head out on my next journey. And he hops into this ring and he just starts running. And I've actually watched them run. They get running so hard and so fast, it becomes a blur. I was like, the mouse is just going nuts running around this wheel. And I'm like, what are you doing? I've actually heard <laughs> that over the lifetime of running in these rings, an average mouse, listen to this, an average mouse can run 9,000 miles. And guess what? He's still in the cage. 9,000 miles to nowhere. And guess what? That's like worry in our lives. A lifetime of frantic running. And yet, nowhere to go. Same analogy. I'd like to give you a quote from a lady whose name is Corey Ten Boom. She's a famous author and poet. You may have heard of her. This is what she has to say about worry. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Here's another quote of hers. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. In other words, worry is completely ineffective. You can't get anything accomplished through worry. Let's continue with Jesus Christ's next point in verse 28, Matthew 6, 28. So, why do you worry about clothing, he says? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They don't have spinning wheels out there making their clothes and making them look pretty. 
And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like any one of these. How many times have we been out in nature, like we're going to be next week in Reno during Sabbath services, up in the high Sierra, looking at the wildflowers and the trees and everything, the gorgeousness of the landscape, and we ooh and we ah when we see this stuff. Um, Crystal and Joe Trone just sent me a couple of photographs this last week, and her caption on the photographs that she sent to me said, we finally made it to the kingdom. Where were you? They sent these two absolutely breathtaking pictures I found out from Switzerland. They're so gorgeous. They're so breathtaking. They don't even look real. But, you know, we look at that stuff, we see that stuff, and we ooh and ah about it, and we think, wow, that's really something dramatic. Well, we do it all the time. Verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today in, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Here Christ is pointing out that worry is illogical. It is completely illogical. He is saying something like this. Have you ever walked through a beautiful garden in the spring enjoying all these gorgeous flowers? It's pretty difficult to be weighed down by life's worries when we see the beauty of God's art. And we look at this stuff and we think, wow, this is really incredible. He might also be asking the question, have you ever seen a lily going through anxiety attacks? Probably not. Actually, you know what lilies were created for? You and me to enjoy. If he cares, if God cares for the blossoms of a lily and the stems and the petals, which eventually just withers and dies away at the end of its season, how much more do you think he cares for you? You who he created in his own image. I mean, you, we, are very, very special to him. We are his crown jewels, as we've heard in previous sermons. We are his glory. We are what he is proud of, pleased about. So much so that when he and Jesus Christ designed us, they designed us, they said, let's make them look just like us. They want us to be like them. As we can also see, the concept of worry is tied to the concept of faith or trusting God and trusting Jesus Christ and what they've told us. Or going back to our year-long philosophy that we've been talking about in virtually every sermon that we've heard for the last year or so, God is in charge of everything. Not the least of which is us. He's got every single one of us right where he wants us. We have some dear friends whose son got into some serious trouble. I may have told you this a week or two ago. He ended up getting shot six times by the police. He's 22 years old. He's going to be incarcerated. They're devastated, as you can probably imagine. Absolutely devastated. Members in the church. When I wrote to them, I said, you know what? As devastating as this is, God has him right where he wants him. God's in control of his life, just like he's in control of every one of our lives. Sometimes we make stupid judgments, don't we? Yes, we do. And they cost us, don't they? Yes, they do. And it's going to cost him dearly. But you know what? God lets it happen. Because he knows the lesson that you're going to learn from that is a lesson that he can take and use. Romans 8.28 is still in the Bible. Everything. Everything works together for good. If our hearts are right with God. So we see that worry is illogical. If Jesus Christ went through all that pain and suffering that he did about 2,000 years ago, that agonizing death for you and me. Why would he then neglect our needs? Why would he go through all that pain and suffering for us so that we could be here today and then neglect us? He wouldn't, and he won't, and he doesn't. We are his top priority Every single aspect of our being is his top priority. And it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we are. So that's why worrying is illogical. It doesn't make any sense at all. 
we're next going to find that worry is actually irreligious. Verse 31 of Matthew 6. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all of these things the Gentiles, or the unbelievers, if you will, seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you have need of, all these things. In other words, God knows what we need for, and he's going to provide for us. He said, you don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. He's equating worry with the comparisons of the Jew versus the non-Jew. Because that's who he's speaking to. He's speaking to a body of Jews back then, individuals that God called, just like you and me today. And he's comparing their unbelief in God and Jesus Christ and trusting them to them as being like an individual that doesn't have God's spirit, an individual that hasn't been called by God, an individual that doesn't even believe in God. As the Gentiles, for the most part, were back then. He said, when you act like that, you're acting like you don't know God exists. He said, that's not the way it's supposed to be. He said, we've got to start living like we believe God exists, that we believe that God created us, and that we believe God is going to sustain us. He's going to take care of everything we have need of. God told them he would never leave them nor forsake them. Yet what are they doing? They're not believing. All they had to do was trust and believe in him every step of the way. The goodness of God, when you look at the Jewish religion back in the old days, the goodness of God was the essence of their religion. And worry was a total denial of the goodness of God. In other words, worrying was not really following or truly believing the promises and the blessings that God gave them. Therefore, it equates out to be irreligious. It's contrary to being religious. Christ has shown us that worry is something that is destructive to our lives. We've already seen that it is inconsistent in our thinking. It is irrational. It is illogical. It is ineffective in getting anything done, and it's also irreligious. It actually proves and provides us reason to want to avoid it, just like we would avoid a deadly narcotic. Now, why do I use a term like that, talking about worry? When you study worry from a psychological and a psychiatric standpoint, they've actually equated the damage of worry to the human body is equated to the damage of a deadly narcotic. And listen to this. Worry is addictive. People actually become worry addicts. It actually provides us reasons to avoid it because we can really come to understand how deadly worry can be. Which, if we see it for what it is, it is just that. A deadly, addictive, narcotic. For some of us, me included at times, we have become dependent upon this lethal drug, worry. It is sometimes foundational to our lives, which is tragic. How can we become free from its oppression? Because we can. Christ gives us the answer next in Matthew 6. He then points out a better way to go about our lives in this often quoted scripture that we're going to read. Christ shows us that what we need to break this addiction of worry is a, set of, a system of priorities in our life. Matthew 6, verse 33 but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? And all these things shall be added to you. All what things? Everything and anything we need to survive this human life. Everything. Christ has a simple prescription for a malady in life that is a killer. The malady is worry. Get our priorities in order. Seek the things of God first and foremost in our daily life and try to live that righteous life that he would have us live that we hear about almost every week at church. 
focus on this, putting aside anything that's a distraction that we can. Can it truly be that simple? Can this formula really work at getting rid of worry? Knowing this verse, Matthew 6.33 and living it are two different things. What actually are our priorities? What do we focus on most throughout every given day of our life? If it's not the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we're going to worry. Because that's not our focus. If our priorities are actually what we read in Matthew 6.33, we will have the trust and the confidence to know that God will work things out no matter what. No matter how bad it seems to be getting, he is going to work it out. He then concludes this passage of scripture with this statement in Matthew 6, verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What we have here is what may be the most powerful asset or tool of all. A systematic strategy to weed out our worries. What's he saying here? Christ is saying something rather interesting here. He is saying that we won't sink under the burden and stress of today's crises. But if we add tomorrow's anticipated challenges, then then, then puts us over the weight limit. Here's another Corey Ten Boom quote to consider. Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength. Carrying two days at once. It is moving in tomorrow, into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it empties today of its strength. In other words, worry accomplishes absolutely nothing. Flip over to Luke 14 now. Luke chapter 14. I want to make a couple of disclaimers before we continue. After having read Jesus Christ's words regarding worry in Matthew 6. First, don't, mistake, don't be mistaken about what we just read to mean that we shouldn't be doing any planning in our lives. It doesn't say that at all. You know, some people will use these passages of scripture to say that any kind of planning means you're not allowing God to add, enter your life and take care of things. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ was an advocate of planning for our futures. He did it many times in many different aspects in his ministry. He spent plenty of time preparing and planning for his departure and planning and working with the disciples so they could carry on when he was done, when he was gone. Here in Luke 14, we're going to see a bit of what I mean. This passage of scripture in Luke 14 is something we use in baptismal counseling, pointing out that we have to count the cost of what we're doing to make sure we're able to accomplish it. A plan for us as future Christians. Let's begin in Luke 14, verse 28. Luke 14, 28, he said, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether or not he has enough to finish it? Planning. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to mock him. It's like this guy got started building this thing, and look, he can't even finish it. Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great far away off, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. Being spiritual includes planning. Planning for things in the future. Planning for things we're going to be doing. Planning for things we're, we're making plans to do. do not, to not do so. To not let planning be a part of our lives is actually a form of insanity. Because then we just let what happens happen. 
And that's not what Jesus Christ is trying to tell us here when he's talking about worry. The second point I want to make as a disclaimer about this discussion of worry is that worry and concern are two different things. Worry tends to focus on the future, the future that we can't do anything about. And concern essentially focuses on the present where there are actions that we can take to actually remedy things. We must also be cautious not to judge one another in this area. We can have deep concern about something and maybe even make a statement like, I'm really worried about blah, blah, blah. Like maybe I made last week, (coughs) talking about Lily. If someone is in that state of mind where they make that kind of a statement, what they need is your prayers. Because they're concerned about something. They're working on something, something that's a challenge in their lives, and they're trying to deal with it, trying to come to grips with it. Pray for them. Don't judge them and condemn them. It's something that we all have to learn to do. It's something we all have to learn to cope with. It's something that every human being on this earth experiences at one point in time or another, and that's the concept of worry. Being concerned about something is fine. That's valid. And we need to know when we cross over the line. Not only you can determine that. So if we see somebody that's distraught and I'm worried about, I'm worried sick, I've heard this comment. I'm worried, I'm worried sick about this. Well, you know what? You're probably rightfully concerned about what it is you're talking about because it's an issue that's going to be a difficulty for you to face for many years to come, maybe many days to come. The person that makes that statement needs prayers. They don't need criticism. Turn back with me to a rather obscure passage of Scripture found in Deuteronomy 33. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 33. It also relates to what we are reading about here today. So how do we daily address this challenge of life, worry? I'm going to give you four things. One, don't dwell on tomorrow's stress. Jesus told us, as we read in Matthew 6, that tomorrow will take care of itself. Deal with today. Let's read one verse here in Deuteronomy 33 and look at another way of saying what I just said. Let's read Deuteronomy 33 and verse 25. Deuteronomy 33, verse 25. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze as your days, so shall your strength be. So what does this mean? As your days, so shall your strength be. Taking it from another translation, the translation is called a translation of the Old Testament scriptures from the original Hebrew. It puts it this way. And as thy days go, so shall thy capability be. Closer. And then another, your strength shall be equal to your days. In other words, and this is really important to understand. When a new day dawns, God will provide the strength and wherewithal to deal with that day. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you the strength to deal with two days or three days or two months or three months. He said, you can deal with today. I've given you the strength to do that. He is providing for us today. Let's seize it instead of fearing it. Point two, don't dwell on yesterday's mess. We've all been there. One thing about yesterday that is always true, it's gone. Never to return. It's history. And you know this is true with our sins too. We are told that God places sin that is repented of as far away from us as the east is from the west. God has forgiven us and he wants us to forgive ourselves. In the 40 or 50 years that I've been in the ministry, One of the biggest challenges that I've seen over and over and over again is people that just will not forgive themselves. For those of us who can't forgive ourselves, we need to consider 
that doing that thing of not forgiving us once we've repented is like saying that we have standards that are higher than God's. That's exactly what we're doing. We are elevating ourselves above God. God who says, I forgive you. We have to forgive ourselves. No matter what it is. You made a mistake. Maybe it was a tragic mistake. Maybe it was a huge mistake. Once we've repented of it and turned our life around, we've got to move past that. Now, we may be reminded of it on occasion, especially if we murdered somebody or raped somebody or molested somebody. But you know what? All of those conditions, God is more than willing to forgive if we're willing to repent, turn our lives around. We have to move past that. If we don't, it's like carrying a ball and chain around and saying, look, I'm better than God. I can still carry this burden around. No, you ain't. You are not better than God. You are not stronger than God. You're not smarter than God. God knows what's best. Point three, don't dwell on yesterday's success. You know, the good old days, which many of us have talked about in our lives. Having been successful in the past can sometimes cause us to lament those times that we can no longer do those things, no longer achieve those things. And we start depressing ourselves because we think, I can't, I can't do that anymore. I'm frustrated with life. I, 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 can't even, I can't even spit my words out the way I used to. I can't lift weights like I used to. I can't run like I used to. I can't speak like I used to. I can't whatever you want to put in there. Don't worry about it. Let it be a fond memory, a positive memory that you can think about and maybe can be used to create new memories today for something in the future. Let us dwell on the miracle of what lies with us today. This moment, this second in our lives. And lastly, point four, don't dwell on yesterday's distress. This may be the hardest of all things to do. Letting go of heartache. Every one of us has or will experience sorrow and heartache at some point in time in our lives. It's inevitable as a human being. Grief and mourning are clear biblical emotions. But they are not permanent ones. We need to keep moving forward, putting one foot in front of the other. And maybe at times things get so tough, the stress and the heaviness is so heavy, it's just baby steps, just barely, barely moving ahead. That takes effort. That takes a conscious effort on our part. Don't look over our shoulders to yesterday's happiness or yesterday's sadness and don't stretch our necks out looking ahead in the crook of the road trying to figure out what's going to happen ahead and tomorrow, maybe the next day, next week. There was a gentleman who was a pioneer in the film industry in Great Britain about 50, 60, 70 years ago. His name was J. Arthur Rank. He had a serious problem with worry in his life. He said it just plagued him all the time, constantly. No matter what he was doing, it slipped back into his head. He, so finally one day he made an agreement with God. He made an agreement with God to limit his worrying to Wednesdays, one day a week. He actually created a Wednesday worry box. And what he would do, every time a worry would enter his mind, he would write it down on a piece of paper, he would stick it into the box. When Wednesday arrived, he opened the box, and he read through all the worries. Much to his amazement, way over two-thirds of them just disappeared. They no longer existed. They weren't issues. And he did absolutely nothing to fix them. As we get ready to close, one last quote from Corey Ten Boom. Worry is an old man with bended head carrying a load of feathers which he thinks are lead. It's fictitious. It's illogical. It's irrational. It's anything you want to call it.
Let me leave you with four scriptures that I would encourage you to write down that you can use as weapons against worry in the upcoming days and weeks in your life. Four scriptures. First one is Psalms 50, verse 15. Psalms 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalms 55, 22. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Third one. 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And lastly, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Have a great, worry-free Sabbath.